All you, Scott. Okay, time to start. Awesome. So welcome everybody. My name is Scott McLeod. I'm an associate professor of educational leadership at the University of Colorado, Denver, not Boulder. We are not the Buffaloes. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, we're downtown Denver because that's where the leadership program is. Um, all those policy folks are up at uh, Boulder. And i um, absolutely delighted to uh, get the opportunity to play host and moderator today for this wonderful conversation. Uh, we have some phenomenal experts who are going to introduce themselves real quickly here, and then we're just going to launch right into our discussion. So welcome to uh, Inspiring Agency in Disruptive Times. So uh, Anindya, why don't you start? Sure. Uh, my name is Anindya Kundu. I'm a sociologist of education. Um, currently, I'm a senior fellow of research uh, at the City University of New York uh, at LMIS, where we assist mission-based organizations. Uh, who work in the workforce or higher education environment to help uh, vulnerable and underserved populations uh, strive for social mobility. My own research is around the context for student achievement, um, social and cultural supports that help uh, underserved students um, from disadvantaged backgrounds thrive. And so that's kind of what this whole book is about, is to think about how uh, the, the agency of students who come from challenging backgrounds can be fostered in educational uh, environments and the collective role we can all play in helping that happen. And so I'm really excited to talk to this amazing panel of experts around educational leadership, uh, who I all believe have read the book and uh, are, are happy with it so far. So that just means a lot to me. So, so thank you all for joining me today. Maurice, you're up. Hi, everyone. Maurice Sweeney, Chief Equity Officer um, for Chicago Public Schools former high school principal, assistant principal, instructional coach and teacher. Um, I'm entering my 20th year in education. Um, it's all about equity for me, um, in particular racial equity. How do we ensure that those who are least served or underserved are getting the right access to resources and opportunities? Um, and definitely glad to share space with these great people. Awesome, thank you so much. Seth? Hi, how are you? Um, first, my name is Lisette Nieves. I'm the Director of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at NYU um, and recently published a book on workforce and looking at college and career pathways and disrupting the kinds of divides that we often think about. So agency is central to that as well. Um, another thing is that my passion and interest is really looking at equity, but making sure that we really include a strong class lens around that as well, intersectional level of class with that. So I'm excited to be here in India. Thanks, Lisette. Go NYU. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we mentioned a couple books here. We should probably uh, mention that our discussion today is centered on India's new book, uh, the Power of Student Agency, and somebody at some point will throw a link in the chat space for that. And uh, if we can get uh, Lisette's book in there too, that would be awesome. Um, so that you all can track those down and investigate further. That would be great. Um, and I guess I didn't mention uh, sort of my own intersection with this concept of agency. Uh, although I'm a professor of school leadership, I spend an awful lot of time with instructional coaches and classroom teachers and principals and anybody else who wants to be an instructional leader thinking a lot about learner agency within systems and how do we hand over teacher-directed and system-directed classrooms and give kids the opportunity to really self-direct and control and own their own learning pathways in ways that allow them to uh, you know, thrive. So that's kind of where my piece of all of this is. So uh, since I get to lead us off, um, in India, I'm gonna twist our first question a little bit. So on page 64 of your book, you have this wonderful quote from uh, Tyreek, I think his name is, right? And he says, they say that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. But scarier is when you lead a horse to water and they say, what water? I was the horse who didn't see the ocean in front of me. Not a conscious decision. I was ignorant to the fact that what is in front of me was water. I used to be a middle school teacher in a, a high poverty middle school in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and Charlotte had this wonderful program in the city where they would bus kids from subsidized housing neighborhoods to the ocean a few hours away. And even though it was just a few hours away, most of the kids had never left the city. 
And I always marveled how excited my kids were to come back and talk to me about what the ocean was really like. Nice. Because they had read about the ocean, they had seen pictures of the ocean, they had maybe even heard and seen videos or movies of the ocean, but they hadn't experienced the ocean. Mm -hmm. So that quote really resonated with me quite a bit. And I wonder if we can attach that quote to your concepts of student agency. When you talk about student agency and you think about this quote from Tyreek, how do those come together? Awesome. Thank you, Scott. I knew I, I picked an amazing moderator You're making me think on my feet here. Uh, and you also found one of my favorite quotes from the book um, that I think really highlights that we want education to be a personalized learning experience for all of our students, for them to be able to demonstrate their agency. And that implies really understanding uh, who they are as a person, it impl implies respect for their humanity. Um, but most importantly, in this context where educational disparities are, are so polarized, it implies acknowledging their background. Um, to be able to think about how to scaffold the opportunities for them to then notice that this is water, this is an ocean, and that ocean is also equally belonging uh, to me to drink at. And so, you know, from, from that, I'll try to build on that by saying my basic premise definition of agency is that it's a person's capacity to leverage resources, you know, mentorship or tap into a network, those kinds of resources to navigate obstacles and create positive change in their lives. Um, for our students, I think this is important because it implies there is this uh, social element to success that uh, there's structural and systematic obstacles that can sometimes be in the way of students' abilities to thrive in academic settings, that it's not just about individual effort or talent. Um, and thinking about, uh, you know, thinking that education is where the best and the brightest succeed, um, sometimes that, those kinds of thoughts um, put the onus of success on the individual. That's kind of the trap that concepts like grit and resilience often fall into, is that they take this social context out of the formula for education and what as a sociologist I know is fundamental to what it takes to succeed. Um, it's, it's implying that the, the environment is just as important as you know, uh, nature. And so a related educational leadership or educational justice topics that are dear to all of us, um, you know, the belief that all students are deserving of a quality education and then working to create the systems and cultures that can allow for that I think those um, ideas benefit from a more holistic view of success in order to foster equity. And so agency implicitly acknowledges the opportunity gap. It almost encourage us, encourages us to not use the achievement gap, uh, something that we've all been cu culturally conditioned to use, but it all, the achievement gap kind of furthers our own thinking that the onus of success falls on the individual. Thinking about an opportunity gap makes us realize that things like a student's birth zip code or their parents level of education are incredibly important if not more important than the school a student even attends um, you know during covid we see this because we know that not all students have access to internet ac internet access which is keeping them from doing vibrant distance learning that more privileged young people are able to partake in and so thinking about the opportunity gap i think is crucial and helping us realize that there are limits to education, but that there are also possibilities. Um, and so agency is thinking about the potential that students have to succeed, forces us to think away from implicit deficit perspectives of, of you know, not those kids. Um, the sometimes not those kids mentalities of education are, you know, a product of a school or teachers being strapped for resources. Um, and those ideas can sometimes be normalized. So to flip that, to, to kind of, help uncover that all students are brilliant, like Tyreek. Tyreek is uh, the quote you read. He was a student who uh, was incarcerated. And it wasn't until his prison experience that he tapped into education because someone took him under his wing and was like, listen, you'd be a great mentor for these younger um, prison detainees who are coming in because they look up to you. So you should be a mentor. And in mentoring them, Tyreek realized, you know what? I should also take more classes. I should take these college level classes. And that's how he started to see the water. And it, it really came from this cultural competency of that mentor noticing a hidden form of giftedness in him and encouraging him. And so those are the kinds of participants that I profile in my book, The Power of Student Agency, 50 people who have come from extremely difficult, challenging backgrounds, but become professionally and academically successful to make the case that success is possible 
um, and, and we should all believe in the success of all students, um, but that there is a collective role that we all can play in helping to create the systems to allow that to, to happen. Cool. Is that Maurice, thoughts, comments, reactions at this stage? What's in your heads? Yeah. yeah. Go oh. for it, Maurice. I'll go right up. Uh, I immediately thought, you know, I'm only about a year and a half, almost two years out of the principalship. And what, what was coming up for me just now was there are so many things that young people have to deal with. Like somewhere in the book, you talk about um, happiness as, a, as like being dynamic and how young people were wrestling. Like, what does that mean? And what is that? And all I could think about what would have what has happened to our young people that those sort of natural human elements of who we are are so um, hidden um, and have to, and space has to be created for young people to see, actually the mentorship quality or, or the leadership quality that Tyreek had was already in him. Um, and that there were people to support what that evolution is and was. And so now he gets to start to thrive and that he finds happiness and joy in that. And, and it, it creates, um, and I'm glad you pointed out like, the, the, the sort of shift from grit to, you know, really agency, um, recognizing that sometimes grit can be associated with assimilating into a particular culture. Like, how do I continue to just do well in this structure and, and not recognize that um, racism, racial discrimination, sexism, xenophobia, all of those things can be contributing to what's causing young people not to thrive. So, um, great. Hi. I I think what excited me about the book, and, and some of it was a bit nuanced in there, was this idea of agency being something that, uh, for me, includes a definition of dignity, includes a definition of what someone is bringing to the table, right? So often in adult learning concepts, we understand and accept this level of identity and what they bring to the table It's a dual learning. We rarely do that with high school, junior high school, early, right? And so agency to me implies this kind of visibility of dignity and implies this kind of asset piece. And so I, I, want, I appreciate that. I love your definition. What I would say it's so important is that we also use an equity lens in deconstructing how we talk about resources, right? Yeah. So often, and but you bring this out with Tyreek and with others, when we think about resources, they have to be seen as assets in our young people. That includes if they work outside of school, that's an asset, right? That includes if they have responsibilities with their families, that's an asset. And so often through these other lenses, that's where our young people become invisible, right? And feel like they can't exhibit their agency. So that's, so I wanted to bring those forth because that's a, a greater expansion in a way, but what inspires me about the work you're doing too. Awesome, thank you. So Maurice and Lisette, we're gonna to get to some of our primary questions for you that we have on our show notes, but I wanna circle Barack back around to this idea of opportunity gaps and, and systems, right? You know, I'm also a systems guy. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's one thing to think about this idea of student agency and opportunity gaps um, within the context of, you know, soulless, heartless, fateless, faceless society, right? Cruel and uncaring. And we throw you out into the world and you have to navigate your way. But it's a whole other thing to think about that within the context of schools and universities, which, you know, would get offended if we said that, you know, they're not all about student agency and empowering kids, right? I mean, we have, you know, tremendous, we have, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of, you know, P-12 educators and university educators, like, what are you talking about? Of course we're about student agency. Of course we're about student empowerment. You know, our whole function of our, you know, university system or our school district or our school is about giving kids agency and empowering them to be successful in life. And yet, it doesn't feel like it's quite happening. So what's going on there? Oh, I'm, I'm going to jump in on that one. Um, what's, what's happening there is that it's still done within an institutional paradigm where one is seen as the expert and the person who is distributing the power of intellect and knowledge to one who's the recipient, right? And so when I use the term dignity and what I love about an India's work is there's this implicit kind of true power sharing that happens in order to see the young person for who they are and what they bring to the table. And I think this even happens not even consciously with a lot of teachers. I think the other piece is, I will say this, 
when you are a new teacher, so many are obsessed with, and I, I'm dying to hear from Maurice on this too, what? Classroom management, the idea of control, the idea of having people in their place, right? Tons is spent on that. And so it's hard to have both a paradigm of that, have a frame of that, while having policing in schools, while having, I'm just saying, these are things that send multiple mixed messages. And what I do love about young people is they do know how to navigate multiple contexts, as we see in an India's book. And when they navigate them, they know which context, how they have to show up in. And they show up in as the passive recipient in context where they know they cannot be truly seen for who they are. Right, beautiful. Yeah, uh, I'm, yes to all of that. One, what's coming up for me too is, first of all, if, if all of that were true around believing that we do these things in schools, we would have better outcomes. So that's a lie to us and we need to, we need to in, the, in, in the CPS equity framework, we call out liberatory thinking as a way to disrupt our own consciousness about what we believe about other people, what we believe about ourselves, because we always like to believe that we're the nice, good superhero doing this work when at times, you know, we can actually be causing harm. And I think that, that we have to continually disrupt that. Um, what, what's coming up for me, I think, is that there has to be some interrogation of what we think we're doing for young people and really to take a pause and do what I see happening in a book is that there's a collaboration. Um, like Lisette talked about the power sharing, like you have to do that in order to actually serve people better. When we go to restaurants, they're like, what are your food allergies? Um, you know, what do you like to drink? What do you like to eat? When we go to the doctor, they're like, what are the pains, right? So there is this, this cooperation happening between people um, and then we get to talk about what are some potential solutions. And I think we have to apply that same lens to education so that when I leave these places, I have my agency and I'm clearer about some of the talents that I already had. Like Lisette talked about the, um, I am seen as an asset. Like I'm actually coming to this place with goodness, with power, with strength. And these institutions should be cultivating that. And when they're not, young people have a right to push back on us to disrupt those systems as well. And I'll lastly just chime in. It sounds like a lot of what this power dynamic question is about is about dialogue. And we should always remember that it's, it's great when we can invite students to the table and elevate their voices. Um, and sometimes that can even be missed, um, even though there is a good intention to, to try to do that. And so I keep, I'm thinking about one example in my book that I, everyone probably also knows is about Joe, who was homeless until... Um, he was homeless with his mom and then his aunt took him in to live with her in Edison, New Jersey. So all of a sudden he had access to the suburban public school and within his first few weeks of going to this new middle school, anytime the topic of uh, Hispanic culture came up, the teacher would now point to Joe to be the representative of Hispanic culture. So all of a sudden in trying to include him, she tokenized him and isolated him, which could have been avoided if she had actually gotten to know him as a person. You know, she might've realized the challenging backgrounds he had come from that maybe he wasn't used to having family dinner time all the time. And so, you know, it's important to, again, bring humanity and dignity back into these conversations and starting with a place of just acknowledging who your students are can help us get there, I think. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, so one of the scholars that has been very impactful on me is uh, Dr. Richard Elmore at Harvard. Um, and one of his key concepts uh, from one of his books is this idea of internal accountability, this notion that if we don't have our act together inside our school system, university, whatever, like it actually doesn't matter what those external accountability mandates are, right? Because we aren't able to come together and say, this is what we stand for, and these are the mechanisms we have for making sure they happen. And here are monitoring and accountability mechanisms internally to make sure that we're living up to the ideals and beliefs that we say we espouse and are trying to enact, right? And it feels to me like in many ways, um, what we're talking about here is that schools and universities, although they talk a good game, may have some weak internal accountability in terms of ensuring that they actually happen. Um, sort of the institutional uh, approaches, right, or lack of appropriate dialogues and training and support systems within, you know, school districts or universities that really allow us to achieve the outcomes that we say we want. 
So I think this is sort of a nice transition to our big question that we're gonna ask Maurice, which is what does internal accountability look like within the Chicago public schools, right? As you think about equity-driven student agency and student voice work, what are you trying to make happen? What are those structures that you have in place to try and make them happen? And maybe most importantly, through the Office of Equity and whatever other avenues within the district, how do you make sure they happen? Yeah, I think first, um, as an Office of Equity, we have young people involved in the writing of our continuous improvement plans. And one of the reasons why we did that was we have to model the behaviors we want to see, and we can't talk about transforming, advancing equity or disrupting the system if we are not living out those values. In the CPS equity framework, we call for inclusive partnerships, which says that if you really want change to happen, you have to have those who are most impacted by inequity, inequity at the table. And that usually in educational settings includes young people. Um, so we do that, they push back on us, and in such a good way that it actually disrupts even sometimes the way in which we're working um, to do better work, not just in service of them, but to do collaborative work with them. We've created some district-wide tools um, uh, that we have an Office of Social Science and Civic Engagement, and they have what's called the 360 uh, Toolkit, which is about helping us as an organization make sure we have student voice in all elements of schools, classrooms, and within the district. And that is helping us to actualize, like, what does a principal do? What does a teacher do to cause that in schools? We have student voice committees um, throughout the district. Dr. Jackson, our CEO, has a, um, a student voice committee as well. But I think one of the, the accountability pieces, um, you know, the framework is still relatively new. And we, what we recognize is this co-design process um, is gonna have to be ongoing and we're gonna have to learn and iterate with young people together. I'm actually reading a book, uh, a workbook called Fumbling Toward Repair. And it's really helping us to think about like what ways might we cause missteps or cause harm and be able to heal from that rather quickly so that students are um, not only engaged in the process, but, the, but the, the things that are designed to be working for, or that should be working for them are actually going to um, help to work for them. So I think those are some of the like broad strokes for the work. But our students right now in the district are, are asking for big demands and, I, and we're still wrestling with, you know, how do we do the right transformative work in the district to do that? So I also want to like to your question around um, institutions assuming, I don't want to paint us, paint us as perfect, but I do think we're making progress on that overall. Cool. So Let's open that up more broadly and say, uh, I mean, the key word that I think you mentioned, Maurice, is together, right? And it feels to me that most school systems and often universities are pretty resistant to this idea of together, right? Why are we so hesitant to give kids, uh, young people and, you know, post-secondary students uh, more voice in their own learning? Well, you know, <laughs> Oh, Scott, that's always such a simple question. I, I, I think that one of the big things, and first of all, just the fact that Maurice is on this panel, the role that he has says something about a vision and a commitment to see this, right? Um, the other things are that Definitely. so often our young people who have the least power in the system are the ones who experience what I call the trickling down piece of feeling like they're not connected, right? If you don't inherently have a collaborative structure, how can you assume that every level is going to recognize the dignity in the other level below them if there's a power structure? So I think we can't ignore that. Um, and so that's an important one too. So how often are teachers feeling that they're working collaboratively with principals and with superintendents and those kinds of things, right? And so you know, we can't ignore how that fits in here. I, I would say that the other piece about it is, is that the fumbling through change, I'm just using, I haven't read that book, but, the, but doing a lot on org theory is that I was just talking to a principal who was one of my top students and he said, that when I moved forward, when we had to rethink our school, was when we had to collectively mourn the harm that we perpetuated not even consciously. And that is very deep. That is, we can't act like that's something you dismiss. How many people have the trust and vulnerability 
in a collegial and work environment to do that to then expand. So I, I just push that forward, which I think that doesn't mean we cannot have that, but there are things that have to happen before there. So we said, I really like the conception of this idea of vulnerability, right? And Mindya, I was struck in your book that you talked multiple times about how even students with agency have to exhibit, exhibit that vulnerability in terms of help seeking behavior, mm -hmm. right? And it feels to me like the same kind of help seeking behavior we want from students with agency, we also need from organizations in the sense of being able to say, here's what we need or where we want to go, and we're gonna need help with that. You, you, you nailed it, and, and I think that, that question of, of help-seeking behavior, especially going both ways, now is the moment to really acknowledge that in all of the different things going on in the world. We are now invited at a time particularly unique in the historical context to reimagine education, uh, to rethink that it's not this power dynamic of, like Lisette was saying, like the jug and the mug. The teacher is the jug and all the students are the mugs being filled up with the same kinds of content and competencies and be, expect that to somehow work. And in this new environment, especially with social unrest going on, we have to understand again that students and young people are there at the table too. They're perceiving everything going on and they have a very important valued experiences and perspectives and and these are teachable moments but they're also learning moments for them so how can we create dialogue that allows them to have a seat at the table because you know soon we're going to be in our you know older years and they will be the ones in these positions to make and push forward policy changes so why not invite them to the table now awesome thank you um Lisa, we've been talking a lot about sort of schools and universities so far. That's kind of the way I framed it. But I know that you also have been thinking about this concept of student agency within um, the broader uh, sort of workforce and workforce education and preparation lens. How does this play out in that arena? Well, I, I, how it plays out is that so often, because there may not be collaborative structures in schools, it's actually through working where young people experience their first sense of agency. Because what it says is I'm getting paid the same way as someone else is getting paid. And there is something of this kind of pride that can happen that can only be built through work that I believe is part of a developmental identity for young people, which is why when we don't acknowledge that work is central to so many young people's lives and we see it as a distraction, we're really missing that they have always been managing multiple contexts and we should be championing them for that. And so that's how it fits in here. And I would say with an India's book, and I think one of the things that, that I love is that his notion of agency challenges this piece of the charity engagement with young people, right? which is if I, if I show you that I need help with this, you're gonna to my need with everything else and this and I only know how to be a giver. His notion of agency challenges that says, this is a moment in that young person's time. This is not everything about that young person. It is a call to stop, to check yourself, to deal with this as a minute, right? He even uses the example of if so-and-so needs more resources and, and they're working, it's not seen as a negative, right? So, so for me in thinking about that, and I say the same thing happens with college students, right? I have seen people say, oh my goodness, you have to help support your family. You're contributing to a family wage, which I do not think is a bad thing. We need to make sure you stay at a community college, right? So there are ways that we have undermined and made assumptions that, are, that overlap with class and race uh, uh, where we actually uh, strip people of their agency. Um, so that's how. Yeah, I think you're bringing that up because what I like in the book, it talks about like youth networking. Um, and, and you know, I was, and this actually triggered my thinking around, you know, people talk about young people in gangs, um, but I say, you know, gangs are families and they're networks. And if we want young people to have different types of networks and experiences, we need to be providing that. And if young people have to lean on other networks, um, 
then what does that say about us as institutions and how do we need to also reframe what we think about young people? And so they're like, I just appreciate the connection between class as well because they are working. That shows us there is already a lot of grit, resilience and agency already happening. And how do we acknowledge that and then continue to build on that and even support, you know, if there are opportunities where they could work less, if there are some um, economic capital ways in which, you know, we can invest in young people um, while they're going to school, that would definitely be a plus. Definitely. I mean, Anindi, I want to say one more thing yeah, about please. you before you jump in. And, I, and one thing that I do appreciate, and Maurice, you made me think about this too, is that, Anindia, when when you go into this notion that so often what's framed in workforce development is that we have to give Latinx and African American young people a social network so that they can do X. You disrupt that paradigm. You actually say, no, wait a minute. This isn't about giving someone something because they don't have it. It's about they already have that and they're building on that. And I think that's radical in the literature. I will tell you that right now. For so many people right now, all the workforce discussions are about assuming that particularly people of color don't have their own networks. And they do, that's a false right. assumption. And so you also go as far as say young people too also have that. So. You know, I, I, I'm nodding so much, my, my neck's gonna hurt after this, after any of you talk. Um, but Lisette, that, that, you know, what you said was, was brilliant. It, I, you know, in an ideal world, what would education look like? Well, it wouldn't be separate, separate from workforce. You know, we wouldn't have a K through 12 pipeline. We would think more towards K, K16, K20 and workforce. Um, we don't, if we think about these pathways as separate, then they become isolated and they only work for those who have the, the networks that the dominant culture rewards. Um, and so, I, you know, I think we also have to change this idea of vocational education. You know, it's always had this weird, wrong, negative stigma, but there's nothing more important than being able to work with your hands. And most of the participants of my sample went to an associate's degree as a pathway to a traditional four-year college. And first of all, we, we can another whole conversation for another day is whether or not four-year college is necessary for everyone. Um, but there's something to be said about understanding that people's educational trajectories can look different and how can we acknowledge that each of those allows someone to bring something new to the table, especially when they're going to be working someday. Now that I do a little bit of workforce research, the biggest irony that I'm finding in the research is that employers always have all of these requirements, right? About what are their requirements for entry level work? but only through working do sometimes people pick up those competencies. So it really requires them to come to the table and be willing to take a young person and train them and understand where they're coming from and do a lot of internal work, do a lot of cultural reframing to become more inclusive. You know, giving someone a job is not supposed to be a hand out. It's more of a hand up, but it's also an acknowledgement that you're now joining our organization. This is going to be a collective culture. So how can we do this work together? And those reframes are, are things that we need to now start doing together. We have to realize that it's not just education, but it's education and workforce. And, and I love the thing that you and Maurice both said is that there are so many ways in which participants of the book showed gifts and competencies. Like Joe, who I was talking about, was taking care of his sick sister, going to school, trying to find housing for him and his mom that night. Those things aren't showing up at class when he's in class and the teacher's about to call on him. So, you know, how can we understand that giftedness shows up in multiple ways? I think that's a question we can keep asking ourselves to build more inclusive uh, learning environments. Y'all, we're doing an awesome job in this conversation. I'm just saying it right now. So uh, we got about 10 minutes-ish left. Um, and so I'm gonna ask each of you to uh, describe maybe uh, what are your favorite examples of student agency and practice? And while you think about that, I'm going to yammer a little bit myself and give you some lead time. Um, awesome. And uh, Anindya, I loved the focus in the book about um, the positive approach that you're taking here, right? Like, let's get away from these deficit mindsets. And as you said on page 110, let's talk about possibilities, right? Instead of wondering about all the reasons why students with fewer resources can fail, why don't we look at the many ways in which they can learn to thrive and how do we best reach them, even if, you know, as institutions or systems, our capacities may be limited somewhat. Um, and I think one of the things that has been most inspiring to me in uh, P2 
education over the last decade and a half has been the rise of these project and inquiry based schools and networks of schools. And, you know, we're finding some really phenomenal ways to give kids agency and voice and connect them with their communities and workforce and so on. And, you know, whether that's, you know, passion and inquiry projects within the school day, whether that's some kind of capstone experience, whether that's community based service learning, you know, whatever, like there's all kinds of possibilities. And I think about a network like the big picture learning network. Uh, where they explicitly build into their model this idea of student internship. So, you know, every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon, for instance, a student, you know, who is provided a free transportation pass, you know, maybe in the city, hops on the bus, train, subway, you know, hoofs it on their bike, whatever, um, and gets to their local internship um, and have a chance to choose as many as eight of those over the course of their high school career because they can do a new one each semester. And what I love about their approach in the schools that I visited is that they've all sent the students out to the internship location, not as free labor, right? Like you're not going there to be cheap, easy labor for the employer. You're going there to learn how to run the place, right? And I love that stance on the work, right? So here I am, I'm talking with a student in Los Angeles and you know, her previous internship had been in uh, a dog kennel because uh, she liked animals and you know she really loved the business aspects of running your own business and learned a ton about that but realized that too much of the job was cleaning cages and whatever and so that wasn't for her so the semester that i visited her school her internship was with a dog trainer and she and i had this phenomenal conversation about sort of you know what's the difference between training dogs and training orcas at sea world and the psychological stuff that's happening here right and she had just submitted her scores to major universities for four-year biology programs you know and i think the pathway from uh, one semester internship at the dog kennel to four year biology major right at a major university is shorter than we think if right. we give these pathways and opportunities and we think about possibilities right so that's kind of my long run up answer to my question uh, who wants to share an example that you found particularly inspiring. I think one. Uh, that, uh, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I keep thinking about, you know, it's funny not being a principal anymore. It's a different world of not being a, a high school leader for 12 years. And I keep thinking about this one student who um, we were looking at student outcomes by race and gender to really figure out how different young people were, what were the performance outcomes. And so we met with different groups and, you know, asked them about their experience in school. And one particular um, student, his name was Jason. And I remember Jason talking about all of the little ways. He was like, yes, we have a football team, um, but as a Latino, I want this type of football team. Like, I want soccer. And, he, and so all of the guys were like, yes, that's what we you know, want. Like, we know that there are sports and programs and all this stuff here, but this is what we're asking for. And for us, um, so I was like, yeah, well, okay, well, we'll do this. And, come back to me with a plan. And they all came back with a plan like in 24 hours. And they were like, wow. this is how much the uniforms would cost. This is how much this, this is how much this. Uh, we know that we would need coaches and just like all of this great sort of stuff that they had designed. And the only thing that, that I did was um, say, come back with a plan. And they did the research to figure out what exactly they wanted. And so, they already know a lot of what they want. It's, I think it's, we have an adultism problem um, exactly. that our young people in CPS are starting to talk to us about. Um, our youth organizations actually do some training and they talk about adultism <laughs> and how we need to sometimes get out of the way. And so the, I feel like the more I invite young people into a conversation and give them the space to talk about the things that are important to them, their agency just, it's right there. It's like a, a ton of water just starting to flow out. And so we got to keep doing that. I, I love that. I love that, Maurice. I, I actually didn't know about adultism before this. And so I'm going to try to use that too. And I, I love your um, example because it, it talks about, you mentioned research. And, you know, we have the just thinking about young people and all they bring to the table, we can we should honestly acknowledge that they're experts of research too. And so that's kind of a little bit of what my effort was in the book is that so much of research sometimes asks 
why did these groups or why did these students fail? Uh, sociology is very much uh, a, a fault of doing this. Um, but instead, I, I, my goal was to try to learn from them to, to highlight their voices about how they were able to succeed. So giving them that expertise and trying to learn from them. And I, I learned so much. Um, Scott's question was about a couple of our favorite examples of agency. And so from my participants, I would say one would be Alicia. Uh, you know, she was raised by a single mom and uh, her mom was an English language learner. And so since Alicia was like six years old, she would help her mom do things like talk to a repair person of their apartment um, and, you know, navigate these adult adult roles that are very unique for like a young child. And Alicia, when I asked her, you know, she, she told me about her GPA in college and how she could, she had a ton of different companies trying to recruit her, but she was going to become a teacher. And so I kind of played devil's advocate. I was like, why are you going into teaching? Why wouldn't you go into something like something a little bit more lucrative? And then she, she turned the question back on me. She said, how dare I, like, how dare I go into teaching knowing these problems that uh, I faced, a lot of students and young people continue to face. And in the same quote, she said something about everyone is brilliant. So, you know, in the beginning of our talk, I said that, but I was channeling my inner Alicia that, you know, if we believe that every child is brilliant, it forces us to rethink education. And, you know, we might call that radical, but I don't think we, we really need to. And one other example of agency, I think, is Jay Studs. Um, you know, he's the, the student whose teacher acknowledged his rapping abilities and gave him access to a recording studio. Um, what's interesting is that set off this chain where he actually did end up in investment banking because he started getting internships at the recording studio and he realized he liked the financial aspect. Um, and my own undergrads once were like, why is this the story of success? Jay Studd going to work for investment banking, like he's now working for the man, the group that, you know, uh, disinvests from communities and it furthers poverty and is it complicit in the capitalist process, you know, these, ra these radical undergrads. Um, and she forced me to think about it, but there's something to be said about changing systems from within. And that's what Jay Studd is doing. You know, he He's making sure that the investment bank is now hiring more men and women of color. And he also chooses to still live in Jamaica, Queens, even though it's a longer commute to work so that every day the kids in his neighborhood see him as an example, the kind that he didn't necessarily have growing up. And so that's the reciprocal nature of agency that can be, you know, systems change. Helping one student's life get better, I think, is systems change because you further their agency to create positive change as well. Hi, can you hear me in India? Yeah, we got you. Okay, great. Well, I had to get on the phone, but it works. Um, so it was interesting here in the tail end of both. And, and, and I would say when I think about some examples of agency, and I'm glad that Maurice brought up the term adultism, it's agency by whose definition and whose terms, right? So I think that that's important that we, we get it that when agency shows up, we can only inspire it. We can't control how it represents itself, right? And I think that there is a letting go of that. That's where the power issue is the shift that happens there. Um, I'll think of two quick examples. One is when I was with Year Up, and we think about that older age, undercredited, not in school, not in work. And this was a fascinating one. This one was related a lot to class. Students would get a stipend. Um, and so what what we saw was that it was around the holidays and there were all these signs in the building that said, adopt a family for Christmas, those kinds of things, right? And so um, a student came to me and said, we want to do it out on behalf of students, but we want to choose the family and we want to donate and we want to do that. I had no problem with that. I thought that was great. My fellow team members, some of the staff were like, they can't have, they don't have enough money in their stipend. Should they be doing this? Is it? It completely tried to disempower what I thought was very exciting. And they did it on their terms. And this is an example of how when people are placed in boxes, even economically, not even recognizing that the working class actually give much more charitably of their, of their income than other groups, right? And so why wouldn't we see that amongst our young people? And so they literally found a family they showed up to this family, they adopted them for the holidays, and they, all 40 of them supported this. And it was a very inspiring thing, but it was a great one to push on class. I'd say another thing that I think is important that I thought was great around agency was that there was this assumption that we all know how to work cross-collaboratively and cross-age and cross-experience. And when I actually saw a teacher ask for help to say, 
how can I actually do partnership building in a way outside with workforce development and supporting our students, then I know we were on the right path. Because the framework to even be able to have this, we assume people have that. How do we partner? We assume people are trained in that. That's not what people are trained in, right? So when we're talking about collaborative efforts without a framework, which is why it's so exciting to have Maurice on this panel too, is that we see that without that, we are having people stumble unnecessarily. And so one is, I would say this too, where I saw a great agency is where I've seen people recruit multiple young people at one time to be on a board, that they have full voting rights, right? That was an interesting piece around that. And also be involved in the pre-agenda discussion. Then we were talking about really recognizing agency. But many times that's not always the case. And I, I actually got to see that in a couple of Brooklyn schools. So just want to share that. Awesome. It's awesome. So we're kind of at the end of our time here. I just want to note that in that um, Nindia's book takes a really positive approach and vibe towards student agency, which is really wonderful. You know, he says right there in the intro that he's defining agency as someone's capacity to leverage resources, to navigate obstacles, and to create positive change in their life. And what we're talking about when we're talking about fostering someone's agency is helping them to help themselves. As he said, it's not a, a handout, it's a hand up, right? And so I think that's a great way to sort of end our conversation is for all of us to think about how can we foster the power of our youth to help themselves and to walk away from some of these adultist structures and systems and practices that are getting in their way. Uh, it's a fantastic book, The Power of Student Agency, Lisette and Maurice, thank you for helping us celebrate in India's new book. Thank you guys uh, so much. Conversation. Uh, it's available at Teachers College Press, who also hosted this uh, discussion today. And, uh, thanks to everybody in the audience for doing this. Thanks, everyone. And we'll, we'll also send out some resources at the end of this to people who attended to about all the different things we talked about. So uh, just in case. Oh, yeah. Thank you yeah. all so much. Thank Happy you, Friday. in India. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Lovely to hear and see from you all. Thank you. Thank all right. you. Thank you. Stop recording, buddy. <laughs> Stop recording? <laughs>